Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Regame Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Samsung, specifically on news of the high bandwidth memory 2 that they have just released. Imagine memory speeds of 1.2 terabytes per second in a four high stack. That's right, 1.2 terabytes per second. It's absolutely startling. Then we'll move over to Intel because they have released a security first pledge. So we'll detail that. Then we'll discuss another piece of Intel news, specifically the 800p SSDs, which aim to bring NVMe drives to the masses using the X point technology. And then we'll finish the video with further details on the Meltdown and Spectre bugs and specifically performance related information now that the um, patches have been released and vendors have started to do testing. The good news is Skylake processors and newer, so for example Kaby Lake, Coffee Lake and so on, have been hit considerably less than if you have a Haswell or older processor. So, you know, if you have, let's say, a a uh, Haswell, well, then you might want to consider that. With that said, let's start with the news. So, I'm going to read some of these details off my mobile phone, simply because I don't want to screw up some of the specifications, but we are looking at Samsung, who have announced the Aqua Bolt HBM2, and this delivers a startling 2.4 Gbps per pin. Now consider that, of course, HBM2 uses 1024 pins, and you can imagine the types of memory bandwidth that you can achieve. In fact, to give you a couple of figures here, which I wrote down earlier, 2.4 uh, gigabytes per pin, um, sorry, GBPS per pin, not gigabytes per second, uh, times 1024 bit, that means you're looking at around 307.2 gigabytes per second. Now, once again, assuming you're using a four high stack, which means not only would you be able to have, let's say, 32 gigabytes of memory, but you'd also be able to achieve 1,000 228.8 gigabytes per second of memory and bandwidth, which is absolutely insane. Of our production of the first 2.4 GBPS 8 gigabyte HBM2, we are further strengthening our competitive leadership and the marketplace. Uh, we will continue to reinforce our command of the DRAM market by ensuring a stable supply of HBM2 worldwide in accordance with the timing of anticipated next generation system launches by our customers. Now, these speeds are achievable with only 1.2 volts going through the memory, which means, of course, just like other uh, HBM packages, this is a great thing if you need to instead put that memory onto the actual GPU itself, in other words, the graphics processing unit, rather than tying that up with uh, feeding lots of GDDR5 modules. Indeed, and once again, I'm going to be reading off a couple of specifications. I don't want to get these wrong. Uh, according to Samsung, they will once again offer 307 gigabytes per second of data bandwidth with a single package. That's once again, eight gigabytes of memory, which is, <coughs> excuse me, 9.6 times faster than a standard eight gigabit GDDR5 chip, which provides 32 GBPS of data bandwidth. And accordingly, this means that you're going to be looking at 50% improvement compared to the older 1.6 GBPS modules, which uh, Samsung were producing beforehand. So the elephant in the room in the IT industry right now is, of course, Meltdown and Spectre. Many were not happy, and that's a massive understatement, with Intel's handling of the Meltdown and Spectre fiasco. Yes, I'm going to use the word fiasco. Intel have promised that there will be transparent and timely communications in the future, which once again was a major, major criticism in the past. And they've also said that uh, customer security is an ongoing priority, not a one-time event. And in the future, they will, quote, commit to publicly identifying significant security and vulnerabilities following the rules of responsible disclosure. And further, we commit to working with the industry to share hardware innovations which will accelerate industry-level progress in dealing with a side-channel attacks, end quote. Now, to that end, of course, I am glad that Intel are going to be taking this more seriously, but I do feel, of course, a lot of this was pressure. And honestly, one of the major issues I had with Intel was 
I wouldn't go as far as to say almost avoidance in their PR claims, especially in the initial letters. And obviously, I'm not quoting this verbatim, but essentially what they were doing was almost like, yeah, we didn't do it. You know, it wasn't our fault. Hey, everyone has this vulnerability. In many cases, of course, that was somewhat true, but they were vulnerable to a much greater degree with many more attacks that were affecting the Intel side of things compared to, let's say, AMD. And it just felt very, very PR-y. There wasn't any, hey, here's what we're doing with the situation. Here's what we're, you know, what we want to, um, you know, here's what happened, why this happened. It just felt kind of like, yeah, the process of work is intended. It affects everyone. Don't worry about you know, anything. It's all fine. In addition to that, Microsoft and other companies are, of course, still testing what type of performance impacts that you're going to be uh, feeling when you patch your operating system. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is if you happen to have a newer processor, and um, we're referring strictly to Intel CPUs here for a moment, if you happen to have an Intel Skylake 6700 or 6600 or any other Skylake-based architecture CPU or newer, then performance impacts are going to be considerably less than if you have Haswell or older, which naturally means that if you do have, let's say, a 2600K and you're already considering, hey, performance is getting a little long in the tooth here, perhaps now would be the appropriate time to upgrade. In fact, I'm going to read out a quick summary. This is from Microsoft's blogs. I'll, of course, place the link in the video description. With Windows 10, a newer uh, Silicon 2016 era PCs with Skylake, Cable Lake, or newer. Benchmarks show single digit slowdowns, but we don't expect most users to notice the change because these percentages are reflected in milliseconds. And Windows 10 with older Silicon 2015 with Haswell or older, some benchmarks show significant slowdowns, and we expect to see users uh, notice a decrease in uh, system performance. So, what type of performance impact are you going to be seeing? are you going to be seeing, excuse me, with Skylake or newer? And more to the point, why is it Skylake, which is less affected and newer compared to, let's say, Haswell or older? Well, once again, according to Microsoft blogs, I'm going to be reading this verbatim because I don't want to mess it up. For context, on newer CPUs such as Skylake and beyond, Intel refined the instruction used to disable branch speculation to be more specific to indirect branches, reducing the overall performance penalty on spectre uh, mitigation. Older versions of Windows have a larger performance impact because Windows 7 and 8 have a more user kernel transitions because of the legacy design decisions, such as all font rendering taking place in the kernel. We will publish data on benchmark performance in the weeks ahead. In other words, Microsoft is still assessing this. So in short, once again, an older combination of hardware and software, you're definitely going to be feeling like a double whammy. So what about the performance data which has been released? Well, some of this is according to Intel's own internal benchmarks. Now, there are benchmarks which are popping out all over the place, but unfortunately, some of these are usage scenario. What speed RAM you've got? What processor are you using? Have you overclocked? What games are you using? What stuff's running in the background? All of this stuff, including other things like what other patches have you got running on an operating system? and even BIOS revisions could potentially be making a difference here. So I have a feeling that we're not fully going to know the performance impact for, let's say, one to two more months. But I'm going to read out a couple of them. I'll place, of course, this image on screen as well. Uh, so it does depend, once again, on the processor. And all of these percentages are pegged to 100. So in short, if you were to score, let's say, 95, well, that means you've lost 5% performance compared to a relative score of an unpatched system which has 100. I think that's abundantly clear. You can see that in a lot of games, for example, 3D Mark, very little difference, 1-2% on the 8700 k and this is also similar for the uh, 6700 ks as well, so that's a good thing. That means that uh, desktop CPUs for gaming often don't notice a performance difference, and to be honest with you, you're primarily going to be limited by the graphics card. Let's just be totally honest here. However, when it comes to some productivity, and obviously this is by no means a complete list, um, some applications can be slowed down. We're looking at around the four or five percent, and I think around eight, maybe eight, nine percent seems to be about the highest that we're seeing an impact. So that's not too bad at all. Really, that's not you know, that's not awful. You're not happy that you've lost the performance, but it's not as bad as what some people had predicted. But once again, I know it sounds like a broken record. This is not by any means a conclusive list of benchmarks. So what would be a good idea, of course, is for you to 
ideally run some benchmarks now, especially if you have an older system, get an idea, for example, run 3D Mark, CPU, Z, you get the idea, and of course games, if you're into games, run some benchmarks, then if you have to, begrudgingly patch your system, and then figure out the performance difference, and decide basically whether it's time for an upgrade or not. Okay, so now the final piece of news for this video, and it's uh, once again, an Intel piece of news, and that is the Optane 800P SSD. I'm going to read out some of the specifications, of course. This is built with an M2 trim, and there are two variants. One is a meager 58 gigabytes, whereas on the other hand, the other is 118 gigabytes. They do say that the drives are rated to read more than about 200 gigabytes of data per day so you shouldn't be particularly concerned with the drives you know crapping out after a couple of months unfortunately performance figures have not been revealed for this drive that's likely however that we'll see similar types of characteristics from other drives within the you know same remit but Apparently, what they are really pushing at is low latency and low QDEP performance. So, in theory, at least, the drives should respond faster to data. And in fact, one of the reasons we're looking at a pair of PCIe lanes compared to four PCIe lanes, and this is, once again, according to Intel, is due to limiting the latency of the drive. Obviously, that's a good thing. With all of that said, as you can probably still tell, uh, we're tweaking the format and figuring stuff out here. Um, it's still not where I want it to be by any stretch of the imagination, but over the next couple of months it should improve some. So yeah, um, I guess we'll kind of see how it all goes. With all of that said, no normal stuff like share, comment, subscribe, and I shall see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.